Good evening. If you have the head of the library with you, go with me to Proverbs chapter 4. We'll begin there just a moment, Proverbs chapter 4. I want to echo what Dad had said. I appreciate those who, have, who are here tonight, especially those who have visited. I know many, some of you have come from a, quite a long way to be here. I appreciate your effort to go and hear the, the Word of God and to worship together with us. I know some of y'all have known for quite a long time, but it's been quite a while since I've been able to see you. And I know we are able to be connected through social media and such, but there's nothing like being able to be together in person to, uh, to meet together once again. I'm appreciative of that. I'm thankful that we have that, that privilege. And as we sang just a moment ago, one day we strive to be pure in heart so we can see the face of the holy God of heaven. And what a blessing that will be for us to join together before him in the glory of heaven. I look forward to that. And I, uh, while we may be separated in this life, we all have hope of uh, being in the glory of heaven together. So I'm uh, good to see you all. We have the opportunity and I hope that as we uh, study tonight together that our, our thoughts will be beneficial, that we can be encouraged to uh, greater faithfulness and once again to help us to draw closer to God in the life that we live. The book of Proverbs obviously is filled with wisdom. I think we're all very aware of that idea. Uh, when we carefully study the book of Proverbs, we can gain a valuable perspective that will enable us or help us to live in a godly way. And I want to look at something that we read here in the fourth chapter. And throughout the entire chapter of Proverbs chapter 4, we find the, the Solomon basically writing instructions as a, a son, a father to his son. Naturally, parents, they want to instill values within their children. They want to raise their children to, to accept the values that they hold dear to them. And, and as we mentioned the other night, there's no greater gift a parent can give their child than to teach them to know God and to, to walk in His ways. And so we find these instructions in Proverbs chapter 4 of, My son, listen to me and give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my sayings. And he goes on and and, and describes various things he wants his son to remember. In verse 23, he says, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. In verse 19, Keep your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. When we think about keeping our hearts, I think that the word keep there is not like, hey, I'm going to keep this, but rather I'm going to guard it. So I'm going to protect it. I'm going to, to keep watch over it so that it does not become destroyed or it does not become polluted. So I want to consider that idea for just a few minutes, guarding one's heart with all diligence. And I want to start by asking or, or dealing with guarding our hearts why is it so important that we guard our hearts? Why is it so important for Solomon to instill that within his son, to watch over his heart or to guard it with all diligence? I, I think, first of all, we need to remind ourselves of the fact that we are to guard our hearts because it is of extreme value. And you think about things that are useless, you don't put a guard over those things. You don't guard things that are of little value. There's a reason we don't put locks on our garbage cans. You go out to the dumpster here, you can jump right on in. And probably few people are really going to care about that because there's nothing of value in there. If you have a safe in your home, you put your most valuable possessions in there, and you're not going to go into someone's house, open it up, and you see garbage in there because nobody wants to keep that. Nobody's especially going to keep that under lock and key. But the value of our hearts is seen in the fact that God is talked about the heart in a number of places. We find in Deuteronomy chapter 6, as we mentioned just the other day in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5, God says to Israel, I will, He wants them to love the Lord their God with all their heart, their soul, and with all their might. And, and throughout the Old Testament and even into the New Testament, we find passage after passage where God says He wants the heart of His people to be devoted unto Him. And so if the heart is the seat of our relationship with God, and it is, if the heart is the very foundation of our relationship with God, then there's nothing of greater value than our heart. So we must protect it 
so that we can enjoy that fellowship with God, and so that we can continue to dwell with God, not only in this life, but also in the life that is to come. But if you go back to, to Proverbs 4 and verse 23, Solomon says to keep your heart with all diligence, for from it spring the, flow the springs of life. You guard your heart because it's the very source of all that you do. In other words, it's the source of everything else in your life. Everything that you say and everything that you do is an expression of what's in your heart. And so Solomon says to watch it, to guard it. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus says, and he's talking in Luke's account of the Beatitudes here, uh, telling us to, you know, how we ought to live, or, or the, the, that kind of section, the blessed are those who do these things, and, and woe to those who, who, who do not keep these things. In verse 45 of Luke chapter 6, Jesus says, the good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good, and the evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. His mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. What people say is an indication of what's in their heart. And when you hear people, whether it's on the radio or in person, we're sitting across a table from them, and we see all kinds of immorality and ungodliness spewing out of their mouth, it's because that's what's in their heart. Jesus says, what you say, and by extension what you do, is an overflow of what is in your heart. You think about a natural spring of water. I've been able to visit several of them. They're kind of cool sometimes. Sometimes you just see some water there, and there's not really much activity. You don't really notice anything. But I've been to one particular spring where you can kind of see it literally bubbling up, and one of the creeks that goes by is filled by this spring. Now, if you go to the, the spring deep underwater and you plug that up, it stops the flow. If you poison it, the flow becomes toxic. And so in the same way, if the heart isn't right, it's going to have an impact upon the rest of one's life. It's going to impact every single part of your life. Because, and so that's why we ought to guard our hearts, because it determines our character. It determines who we are. And if you go back to the book of Proverbs, there's many passages in the book of Proverbs that would tie into this. But I'll look at Proverbs 23 and verse 7. Proverbs 23 in verse 7 here Solomon says, As he thinks within himself, so he is. As he thinks within himself, so he is. What's in our heart determines our character. And you see that in the New Testament as Jesus butts heads with the Pharisees often, it's because their heart wasn't right. Remember? In Matthew 15, beginning in verse 18, and Jesus has just rebuked the Pharisees because they, you know, they asked Jesus, why don't your, your disciples keep our traditions? And Jesus said, well, why do you put your traditions above the word of God? And he says, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. In verse 18, Jesus says, The things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile a man, for out of the heart come evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and fornications and thefts and false witnesses and slanders. And you think about the people around us and all the wickedness that they're involved in, and you kind of sit back and wonder, how in the world does somebody get to a point like that? How does someone reach the point where they murder another person who's made in the image of God? They get there because their heart's not right. How does someone get to the point of adultery or fornication? It's because their heart's not right. Or how do they get involved in sin and their life is overtaken by it? It's because something's wrong within their heart. And what their life is, the, the, what their life is, is an expression of the fact that their heart is impure and it's improper before God. 
And so everything that we do, our character will be determined by what's in our heart. And so that's why Paul says, or Jesus says, to, or Solomon says, to watch over it, to guard it. And we might also say that the heart is the source of faith. If you go to Romans chapter 2, in the first chapter, he's dealt with the fact that all have sinned, and particularly the, the Gentiles, they've sinned against the Lord. In chapter 2, he more focuses on the Jews. And you know the Jews, they kind of puff themselves up. We're God's people. We have God's law. We're kind of better than you Gentiles over there. And Paul says, well, you didn't even keep it. Yeah, you had the law of God, but you broke it. And so you're no less of sinner than anybody else. But in verse 28 of Romans chapter 2, Paul says, He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor a circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. It's not mere externals. But he is a Jew who is one Inwardly, And that circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit and not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. And we go over to the 10th chapter, Romans chapter 10. And in verse 10, with the heart, a person believes resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It starts in the heart. That's what God's concerned with. God wants our hearts to be pure. God wants our hearts to be right before Him. So that way we can please Him in the life that we live. And so, with that in mind, it makes no... It kind of causes you to realize there's no wonder then, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, that Paul says, set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. That's, from, that's verse 2 there. I, I get it honestly. And I put the wrong verse up. Anyway, he said in verse 2, set your mind on things above, set your heart on things above. If you're raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You know why that's so important? I think if you go to Romans chapter 8, Paul helps us to realize just how important that is or why that's such a big deal. <laughs> Romans 8 and verse 5. Paul says, Those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. You look at somebody and see what their life is like. If it's fleshly, that means they set their mind on the flesh. And if they're a spiritual person, it's because they've set their mind on the things of the spirit. And he says the mind of the flesh is the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Why is it so important that our mind is set on things above and not on things of the earth? Because to be spiritual, our mind has to be set on spiritual things. And that's why it's so important that we guard it. Because our, we're not going to lead that spiritual life if our mind is not right. If our heart is not right before God. And so we guard our hearts because it's extremely valuable. Because it's the source of everything that we do. And because it's constantly under attack by the devil. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we find the, the discussion of the spiritual battle that we're engaged in. We're living in a combat zone. And I'm not talking about a physical war here. We're talking about a combat zone, but the goal is our heart. You think about the game, and I, I don't want to trivialize this, but I think this somewhat helps to, to illustrate the idea. You think about playing the game Capture the Flag. You've got multiple teams, and, and they've got a flag that's set up on, on their base, and and each team is trying to go steal the other person's flag, but they're trying to protect their own flag. I don't want to say that we're playing a spiritual game of capture the flag, but we're perhaps we're playing a spiritual game of capture the heart. Because that's what Satan's after. He's after our hearts. And he's not after our hearts so he can bless it, so he can protect it, so he can guide it. He's after our hearts so he can destroy it. Satan wants to destroy your heart. And he wants to destroy your soul. 
And that's why he goes to such great lengths to try and destroy your heart. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, Paul deals with that spiritual battle. In verse 3, he says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of the fortresses. Verse 5, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This is a battle that's in our minds. He's presenting, he says, your speculations and every lofty thing that's exalted itself against the, the heavenly places. And in order to be successful in this battle, we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Guard your heart, in other words. And going to the other familiar passage, we find in Ephesians chapter 6, where he describes the, the armor of God. The armor is designed to protect us in this battle and to help us keep our hearts pure from the defiling influences of the world around us. Notice the nature of these kinds of, of, of this kind of armor. He says in verse 11, put on the full armor of God so you may be able to stand against the firm, stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Our struggle, struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the powers and against the spiritual forces of this darkness, against the spiritual for forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Take up the whole armor of God so you, be, you will be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand. And then he starts to describe the armor. It's dealing with truth and righteousness and the gospel and faith and salvation and prayer. These aren't just physical things that we carry with us. They're things we carry in our hearts. And when we have these things within our heart, it protects us against the devil. It protects us against everything that he's trying to throw at us. So we guard our hearts. Because they're valuable. It's the source of all that we do. And they're under constant attack. But what happens when we don't guard our heart? What happens if I don't do a good job protecting my heart? I think there's an example of that in 1 Kings chapter 11. It's a sad reality that Solomon is the one who writes this in Proverbs 4 verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence. And yet we find recorded in 1 Kings chapter 11 that Solomon didn't really listen to his own advice. 1 Kings 11, verse 1, Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughters of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning the Lord, which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, You shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after their gods. Solomon held fast to these in love. Notice verse 4, when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of his father David had been. What happened when Solomon did not guard his heart? His heart turned away after other gods. This is not just a matter of if I get around to it. This is not just a matter of it's kind of a good thing if you can do it, but if not, it's really not that big a deal. It's a matter of eternity or not. It's that important because Solomon's heart was turned away from God and God's not pleased with Solomon. After all, in the very next verses, God tears the kingdom away from him because of his wickedness. Those are the consequences. And you think about the nation of Israel. God said there in verse 2, he, he warned Israel as they go into the promised land. He tells them, don't associate with these people. Don't marry them. I want you to remove them from before your midst because if not, they're going to be thorns in your side. And in Judges chapter 2, we find the sad commentary on Israel. They didn't listen. Well, that's kind of the way Israel was. They just didn't listen, right? And it says there in Judges 2, God says, you know what? I told you to remove these people, and I'm not going to do it because you didn't listen. 
And he says, now there are going to be thorns in your side. And that's exactly what happened. And we know throughout the history of Israel, they were constantly going over into idolatry because they had these people right before their, their eyes who were wicked. And you kind of sit there and think, well, duh! What do you expect? And yet, we look at people around us today and we're no better. And we're no different than the people of Israel. We like to sit back and think, oh man, Israel, they just messed up. But we do the very same thing. The very same thing. When we don't guard our hearts, like Solomon did, we lose them. They're turned away. And we open ourselves, our hearts, to becoming corrupted by sin. Whether we're willing to admit it or not, sin damages our hearts. And that includes if we're actively involved in it. Obviously, that's going to damage your heart. But it also damages your heart even if you're just surrounded by it. That's why God told the Israelites to remove them from before your midst. And social media can be a wonderful thing. There's a lot of good that can come from it. But I also find a lot of frustration with it. Because I see my brothers and sisters in Christ living in worldliness. And if that's not bad enough, they're flaunting it on the internet for the world to see. They've not guarded their hearts and they've been overtaken by worldliness. It's just like Solomon. Just like Israel. And I think it starts with a denial of the impact that sin has on us. Some people are outright denying their involvement in it. And we mentioned somewhat to this effect last night. Sometimes they just either outright lie, well, I'm not doing that, or they start to play games with definitions and they lie to themselves, really, and say, well, you know, this means that, and what I'm doing is not really kind of some way twisting, you know, and then some way, form, or another. It's, it's a little different what I'm doing. Or, We've got sin all around us. We expose ourselves to it constantly. And we deny the impact that it's going to have upon us. How much it's going to affect us. I can watch that movie and the sin in there. That's, I, I know that's not right, but I'm not gonna, I'm not participating in it. It's not gonna bother me. It's not gonna affect me deny its impact, both whether we're actively involved in it or just surrounded by it. And that lack of honesty with ourselves is going to prevent us from properly guarding our hearts. And then some may admit it, but they try and minimize their involvement in it. And so when they minimize their involvement in it, they're trying to convince themselves and they're trying to convince others, perhaps, mostly themselves, that it's really not that big of a deal. And so we'll listen to music on the radio that's full, or, or movies on the, the TV that's full of all sorts of immorality, and, and we might say things like, that. well, there's just a few words in it. I know there's some language, but it's not that bad, really. Or we listen to music that's filled with all sorts of immoral themes and, and language, and we say, well, I just kind of like the beat. I just like the beat. The, the beat's kind of cool. Or I know these people that I'm hanging around with, I know they're immoral and, and I do things that they shouldn't, but at least I'm not partaking of it with them. We minimize and think it's not going to happen to me. It's not going to happen to me. And then eventually we're going to rationalize our involvement in it and then we're going to justify what we're doing. And then eventually we get to the point where we openly celebrate the sin that we're involved in or that we're constantly being exposed to. We'll openly discuss the kind of movies that we're watching. We'll openly discuss the music that we listen to and the people that we associate with. 
And there's no longer any sense of guilt for the corrupting influence that they have upon our hearts. And we don't see it anymore. There's something I've seen going around recently that says the sin which once hid out in the back alley is now marching proudly down Main Street. And as sad as the reality of that is, our own brethren are sitting there supporting it. And thinking it's not going to affect me, and it's not going to hurt me, and it's not going to harm me. Let's go back to the book of Proverbs and see a little more wisdom here. Proverbs 6 and verse 27. Proverbs chapter 6 and in verse 27. The context here is dealing with immorality, sexual immorality, and really the idea of a, a seductress, an adulteress. He says in verse 26, or verse 27, Can a man take fire into his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Or can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? It's not that big of a deal. It's just a few words. I know they're immoral, but you know, at least I'm not doing it with them. Can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burned? You know the old saying, you play with fire, what's going to happen? You're going to get burned. And we're not exempt from that as Christians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we find this warning, and I'm sure we're familiar with that. Uh, to be fair, in the context, he's dealing with false teachers, he's dealing with the resurrection, the fact that there are some in Corinth who have denied the resurrection, that there's not going to be a resurrection. And Paul says there in, in verse 33, do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. But then the context there, he's saying, don't, be, don't think that you can associate with these people who deny the resurrection and, and expect that it's not going to have some kind of impact on you. And I think we can make the application there in a broader sense. Don't think that we can constantly surround ourselves by sin and it's not going to have an impact on us. It will. And notice how he begins that in verse 33. Do not be deceived. Another way of saying that, stop lying to yourself. Stop lying to yourself by thinking, it's not going to happen to me. You're not as strong as you think you are. And I promise you that. We all have that fantasy in our minds that think that it's okay because I'm strong enough to handle it. And it's not going to overtake me. But it will. And it might not be the first time. But eventually it's going to corrupt you. And it's going to overtake you. You think about a giant bucket of water, I'm talking about like a 55 gallon drum, and it's filled with water, and you take a tiny little drop of poison, and you stir it all up. I'm not an expert, and please don't try this, because the off chance that it doesn't quite work this way. But I assume that that poison would be diluted enough that you could probably drink all of that, and it's not going to hurt you. Again, please don't try that. I won't be responsible for that. But sin is poison. And every time we expose ourselves to it, we're putting another drop in there. And we think, it's not going to happen to me as we're pouring more poison in our heart. I heard a lesson years ago about a guy telling the story about his father-in-law had been diagnosed with cancer. And the, the point of his lesson was he watched his father as he was dying. He watched his father and he learned these lessons about how to live like you're dying. How to live each day as if it's your last. And he said, and at one point that he remembered, he, he liked to watch these Western movies. And I don't really watch those, so I don't know if all, I don't know that all of these are necessarily this way, but there came a point in the movie where this couple was about to commit fornication and he called them 
Turn that off. Turn that off. And so he called them in. They asked them to turn the movie on and asked them to come in and sing hymns with him. And the point that was made is he didn't want to, he knew he was about to stand before the Lord and he didn't want those things in his heart as he goes to stand before the Lord. It's that important. It's that important that we guard our hearts. Because I think I'm strong enough, but I'm not. And going back to there to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, bad company corrupts good morals. There's no exception there. There is no exception there. It doesn't say it corrupts good morals if you're not careful or if you're just not strong enough. It corrupts good morals and stop playing with fire. Because eventually we're going to become callous. And that's the warning there in Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 17, Paul says, This I say and affirm together with the Lord that you no longer walk just as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Their hearts are futile. Being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become cowards, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. How did they get there? In the futility of their minds, because of the hardness of their heart, they've become cowards. And then he continues on to say, you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have been if you have heard him and have been taught in him just as the truth, the truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former conduct, that you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the deceit, lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Renew your heart. And the blessing here is that we can reach a point where we find that we've become callous. But our heart can heal. We can renew our heart to righteousness so that it's no longer callous. Jeremiah 6, he's describing the failure of Israel and he says in verse 15, were they ashamed because of the abomination they had done? They were not even ashamed at all. They did not even know how to blush. It's a sad point when Christians can involve themselves in sin and there's no guilt. Or we hear it on the TV and we don't think twice about it. Have you ever told somebody about a movie? And you think about that. Oh, that was a pretty good movie. I don't think there's much language in it. And you go and watch it with them, and then you, every time there's profane words uttered, you go, I don't remember that. Oh, I forgot that was there. We've forgotten how to blush. And we've forgotten the corrupting nature of sin. But once again, can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burned? When you play with sin, you're going to lose every time. Solomon said, guard your heart with all diligence. And when he failed to do that, his heart turned away from God. How, then, are we to guard our hearts? How can we guard our hearts to make sure that they remain pure? First of all, you need to recognize the importance of it. Again, realize the value of your heart, as we mentioned earlier. That is the seat of everything that you do. Because a failure to guard your heart will result in spiritual failure. Just like Solomon. That can happen to you. And think about who Solomon was. He was one who was abundantly blessed by God. He's the son of David. 
who is known as a man after God's own heart, who is given wisdom more than any man who ever lived, and yet Solomon himself had his heart turned away from God because of the corrupting influence of sin. If we hope to dwell with God, we must guard our hearts to ensure that they remain pure. It's that important. And we'll talk a little more about that relationship with God on Thursday when we deal with holiness. Recognize the importance of it. And then minimize the trash. In Hebrews chapter 12, we find the discussion of faith there in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. And I know you've heard that say this before. When you find this uh, book ended by the fact that they needed to endure. And he says in chapter 12 and verse 1, we have this great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and run with endurance the race that is set before us. What that means is as you run this race, you're not carrying around a five-gallon jug of water on your back. You're going to break your back that way. When I remember when I was in high school, after school, and we would be practicing, you'd see some of the sports teams out there, and they'd have these sleds, and there was a post sticking up from the sled, and there would be weights that they'd set on them, and they would tie the weight, the sled to themselves, and then they'd start running. And that's to build up their muscles so that they could run faster. But you know what? When the race is run, they take that weight off. But how many Christians never take the weight off? What lies do I believe about myself or the world around me, and how is that affecting my relationship with God? A couple questions to reflect on as far as minimizing the trash. What sins or bad habits in my life are weighing me down from a higher moral conduct? What sin is holding you back from being the moral person that God calls you to be. If you remember there in Romans chapter 12, Paul urges these brethren in verses 1 and 2. He says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That means some things that I hold dear, some things that I like, maybe I need to set those aside so that I may lay hold of eternal life. And he says in verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Fix your heart. And it will transform your life. Change your heart. And it will completely change your life. It's that big of a deal. It's that important. We cannot allow ourselves to be conformed to this world. And as we mentioned there in Colossians, or Romans chapter 8, a few minutes ago, if we're conformed to this world, it's because our mind is set on the things of the flesh. But if we want to have a spiritual life, then we must set our mind on the spirit, on the things of the spirit. And that's the only way that we can be transformed. To be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's not some magic fairy dust that we can wave over our hearts to make sure that they remain pure, but we can remove as much of the sinful influences around us as we possibly can. And I realize we can't get rid of all of it because we still have to go to work and we still have to go to school and we still have to be around people that are ungodly and wicked, but we do have control over the things that we consume. I have control over the things I watch on TV, and I have control over the things that I listen as I'm driving down the road. And let me tell you, in 2021, Christians have no excuse anymore. 
Because we have the ability for just a couple dollars a month to buy a streaming service of music or, or even TV shows and movies. And you get to pick what you watch and what you listen to. We have no excuse anymore. And as an aside, if you think that the media is not trying to influence you, you're lying to yourself. You're lying to yourself if you think that the media does not have an agenda. And I'm not talking about the news media either. I'm talking about the music industry and the movie industry and the Hollywood and the entertainment business. They have an agenda and they're trying to, to corrupt your soul. And if you don't believe that, start reading some books and find out for yourself. It's there. And I came across something a while back saying the reason why Hollywood has so much in their movies that corrupt your Christian world is because you keep spending money to go see it. And that hits a little close to home, doesn't it? If you want to have a pure heart, remove as much garbage as you can from your life because it's destroying your soul. It's destroying your heart. And if you want to be pure, it has to go. But then we need to replace it with something. We need to store up the Word of God in our hearts. As we mentioned the other night, the 119th Psalm is all about the Word of God and it says in verse 9, Psalm 119 and verse 9, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. It's that simple. It's that simple. Verse 10, With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart so that I may not sin against you. What is he placed within his heart to keep him from sin? Not the junk that Hollywood wants to promote. The word of God. That's what he stores in his heart. Keeping the word of God will enable us to stay away from sin. And we can use the word of God to overcome temptation and to help us to draw closer to God. There's a reason why in Ephesians chapter 6, the only offensive weapon that Paul mentions there is the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. And you know, in Matthew 4, when Jesus is being tempted by Satan, every single time he responds to Satan by saying, it is written. Because Jesus surely had the word of God stored in his heart. And you see the life that resulted from it. Store up the word of God from your heart, in your heart. Let's go back to Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 4, rather. Proverbs chapter 4. You have to rub not on me a little too much here. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 24, 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Notice for the next few verses. Put away from you a deceitful mouth, and put your devious speech far from you. Let your eyes look directly ahead, and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet, and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the left or to the right. Turn your foot away from evil. <coughs> So those following verses says, keep your heart with all diligence. And then he says, watch your mouth. Watch your eyes. And watch your feet to ensure that they are kept from evil. And you know what that sounds awfully close to? It sounds an awful lot like that song that I learned in the back room over here. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. And be careful little ears what you hear. Be careful little feet where you go. And be careful little hands what you do. Let me ask you something. How old do you get where that doesn't apply anymore? We see that PG-13 rating on that movie and we think, well, I'm old enough. I'm 15 now. I can watch that. Be careful little eyes what you see. As we mentioned the earlier the other day, we get a little older and the profundity of those songs are lost on us. Because we don't sing them anymore. 
and we don't talk about them, and yet they have such profound messages, which is why we teach them to our children anyway, in the first place. Sadly, they're too young to realize just how profound those messages are. That's essentially what Solomon's saying here. Be careful what you see, and what you hear, and what you do, and where you go. And when we keep ourselves from evil, what we find is that we're making no provision for the flesh. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, 13. Romans chapter 13, he talks about, oh, no one anything in verse 8, uh, except to love one another. He talks about the law. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. They're all summed up in this, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, love does no wrong to the neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Do this, knowing that the time, knowing the time that is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near, therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. You give as little opportunity as you can to sin to enable it to take hold, take hold of you. You remove every possible av avenue that sin has to corrupt your heart. Make no provision for the flesh. By being careful what you see, what you do, what you hear, and where you go. And then finally, you pursue holiness. Pursue holiness. One of the verses, the sections that I've really become <laughs> fond of is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 14 to the end of the chapter. Actually, to chapter 7, verse 1. Verse 14 says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship of light with darkness? And he makes those contrasts. And he says in verse 16, We are the temple of the living God. And you think about the temple in the Old Testament. You had the most holy place where God would dwell. But he says, You are the temple of the living God. Therefore... I will dwell with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Almighty. We're going to talk a little more in detail about that on Thursday. But if you want to guard your heart, pursue holiness. And in order to pursue holiness, it means you separate yourselves from that which is unholy. What fellowship is righteousness with darkness? And what fellowship is light with darkness? We need to remember that very carefully. When we're invited to go places where there's all sorts of sin, I don't belong there. Pursue holiness. Come out from their midst and be separate. And I will receive you, God says. There's one last thing I want to point out, and then we'll conclude our study. Back in Proverbs 4 and verse 23, Solomon says, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Guard your heart with all diligence. As we mentioned earlier, we things that are of value to us, we protect. 
And maybe you've said this yourself, or maybe you've heard it before. I'm sure all of us have heard it, or at least heard it from somebody. When somebody is entrusting something of tremendous value to themselves, to another person, whether it's their own child or, or something of, of just extreme value, they say, I want you to guard this, and I want you to guard it with your life. When Solomon says to guard your heart with all diligence, he's telling us to guard it with our lives. Because it is our lives. You guard your heart with all of your being. Because it is your entire being. And it's that important. It's that important. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. And in verse 9. Moses says, only give heed to yourselves and keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things that your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. He's not just saying, hey, maybe remember what I've said here. He says, give heed. Pay attention to it and keep diligently your soul. And then finally, Proverbs 16. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 17. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He who watches his way preserves his life. He who watches his way preserves his life. Keep your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. And our heart is the seat of all that we say and do. And it's the seat of our relationship with God. Do you want to dwell with God? Guard your heart. If we want to hope to draw closer to God, we need to make sure our heart remains pure. Because God being holy cannot behold that which is unholy. If our heart is filled with unholiness, then God's not going to dwell with us. We're not going to dwell with God. And so purify your hearts and guard it with your lives so that we can dwell with God. Guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. If you've not been guarding your heart, and I hope these have, things have been encouraging to you to help you and or encourage you to do so, because it's of utmost importance. It's of eternal importance. Our life depends on it. And if you've not had your heart cleansed by the blood of Christ, then I hope you would take advantage of the opportunity that we have right now. To be buried with Christ in baptism and raised up in the newness of life and have your sins washed away so you can be pure and whole before the Lord. We'd be thrilled to help you become part of the family of God right now. And if you are a child of God, maybe you haven't guarded your heart. Maybe you haven't been keeping it pure. Let's resolve that I'm going to remove the garbage so that I can walk with the Lord. And that he can renew me and he can restore me and he can cleanse me. And if we can pray with you, if we can help you in any way and make your life what it ought to be, we'd be glad to help you and to welcome you home. The Word of God, as we mentioned the other day, the gospel is about relationship. God wants to dwell with his people. And so these rules and regulations that all these people rail against are teaching us how we can dwell with God. And so the gospel is given as an invitation to draw us to God so we can take part of the blessings that are found in Christ Jesus. That invitation is extended to each and every one of us right now. And if you need to respond to our Lord's invitation, why not now? We stand and sing together.